Hi, I'm Hannah. And I'm Lewis. Um, we're both students at Portslade Aldridge Community Academy. And today, as part of the Aldridge Foundation's Sports and Fitness World Work Week, we're chatting to sports nutritionist Matt Lavelle and physiotherapist Ben Kilner um, to find out more about getting into the sport industry and hopefully gain some information for when we leave school and have some advice. So, yeah. We've got lots of questions to get through today. So for everyone joining us live, please feel free to add your questions in the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Matt and Ben. If you want to introduce yourselves and give us a brief overview of um, your work. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Ben. Um, originally I'm from Barnsley in South Yorkshire. Uh, my background's in physio. Uh, since then I've kind of moved and progressed through uh, and kind of transitioned into kind of more personal training, muscle conditioning. Um, but I still, still use elements of physio in my profession. Um, and I run a business uh, in central London in Mayfair where we have a group of trainers. Uh, we actually have some private physios as well. Uh, we work together and produce health fitness plans for clients in and around the Mayfair area. Uh, originally, we focused on um, triathletes, uh, but now we're kind of more uh, corporate uh, workers in and around the uh, uh, main city of London really. Yeah th thanks Ben it's yeah uh, good to good to hear you're still doing well in the in the in the city and all that mate. Uh, I've known Ben quite a few years now through various uh, aspects where you know there's always a crossover between um, nutrition and phys physiotherapy and training and all that sort of thing. Uh, I'm I'm uh, a uh, sports nutritionist mostly, but I do health nutrition as well. Um, I got into it in a roundabout way uh, via personal training first. It does help to know across disciplines what everyone's able to do without thinking that obviously you can specialise in all areas. It's best to have a be a specialist in one area, but be able to draw in uh, on other areas as and when you need to help people. So um, I've worked across all, all different types of elite sport, um, as is the way with these things, careers transition and the economic factors plus COVID always take a, I mean, you have to pivot a bit and turn in different directions in order to stay buoyant and keep your business running. And so I, I would say I'm <clears throat> where I started at 80% sports, I'm now probably 80% corporate, which is where you apply the, the sports protocols that you've learned into the corporate arena. And that would be the phrase people sometimes use is corporate athlete. So people quite like that. The, the big wigs in companies like being treated in a nice way and, and treated like athletes. And a lot of them, you know, work as hard as athletes, not in the gym, but pushing themselves mentally and physically. Well, um, has sport always been a big part of your life? And is this the career you imagined for yourself when you were at school? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, sport for me as a kid, as far back as I can remember, I think all I've got two brothers, uh, one older, one younger. All I, all I remember doing is playing football, basketball, cricket, any kind of sport that we could possibly think of, making up games. On the street, uh, we were the kind of classic late 80s, 90s kids. We didn't really have computers. You just ride your bikes and uh, play out until you couldn't see anymore. It was pitch black. And your mum and dad were calling you in. So sport was definitely part of my lifestyle from an early age. I definitely wasn't naturally academic. Um, I was definitely counting down the clock looking for PE time or dinner time where you could just go and kick a football around. Um, and then, you know, as I got older, obviously, uh, things evolved. If, if I look at my career kind of progression, where I wanted to go as a, as a kid, as an early teenager, I was probably the stereotypical kid just wanting to be a sports star, um, predominantly in football. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at a decent academy in Barnsley, uh, part of Barnsley Football Club's academy. Um, and then I had a 
personal, um, wasn't an injury, I had a, a setback, I had a disease in my hip. I don't know, maybe this will be relevant with a few questions further along, but uh, long story short, I couldn't walk for about two, three years. So that kind of stopped my kind of personal sport ambition, but it, it gave me a new opportunity because I had physio on myself for three years to get myself walking and running again. Um, so that kind of opened up my eyes to a, a progression into, into physio, into health. Um, and then my mindset was very much wanting to be a, the football physio, which most physios, uh, particularly if they're into sport, they want to be the sports physio. Um, so that was the kind of aim, at kind of your age group, uh, kind of 16, 17, 18. And, uh, but overall, having gone through that, having touched football physio a little bit, um, my kind of career pivoted, my interest changed. I looked at different uh, areas and skills and kind of like transitioned into other areas of physio and personal training and kind of, like I said before, kind of gone more a little bit like Matt, a little bit sport, but predominantly now more kind of corporate um, training and health. Yes, so <clears throat> the, the, the I, I think my career probably started when they offered free karate lessons to our whole school. I think I was 11 years old. So up until that point, I was a bit like Ben. I was playing out rollerblading, BMX, whatever, you, because there was no video games. So it was an active youth. And then at 11, the, these karate lessons started. So first night, there was 200 kids in there and they beasted us. And then two weeks later, there was like eight of us left. So that started a, a kind of inquisitive mindset into, well, what makes you better at karate? Uh, and then you just start learning, reading, bearing yourself in books. And bear in mind, this is all before the, the internet. So you, you, were, you were down the library and the resources were limited there. So you had to really seek out experts with a, you know, um, <clears throat> questionable experts in your local area in all the various disciplines. And you, you picked out the bits that worked for you and dropped the bits that didn't. But I think certainly being physically active and wanting to do, do the very best you can in, in, and both of you guys want, you know, basketball, cricket, I think that ties in really nicely to any career in health and fitness because if you don't understand what it is to be highly fatigued from pushing yourself to the limit all the time, then you won't know the right things to do from a physiotherapy point of view. You won't know the right things to do from a nutritional point of view or strength and conditioning. So you almost have to be, I think, your own, your own guinea pig along along the way and I think being in a team sport or individual sport and trying to get to the very top of your level that you can uh, is is a real a real asset to anything you can go on and do do afterwards you know people know the way these things work is people will know whether you you are authentic or not when you're delivering your information or or you're <clears throat> practicing your craft and, and they're quite quickly know the ones who have been through the mill and done, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk kind of thing. And the ones who haven't. So yeah, physical activity is key, I think. What Matt said is, is in terms of uh, like being involved in sport, um, even if you're not an elite sportsman yourself, even if you just, if it's recreational sport and just a background in sport, the, like we always have a bit of a joke in the training world. We use like a rate of perceived exertion, you know, a simple kind of scale of one to 10. Tell me how tired you are on a scale of one to 10. You know, a lot. it's amazing how the guys that use, are used to kind of being in sport kind of will always, you know, will know what hard work is on a seven out of 10. Whereas the ones that don't tend to be, I'm 10 out of 10 in reality, they're more like five. And, and you kind of get a, a perception of, you know, this whole profession is as much about kind of gauging personality traits and you know relationship building as it is with you know knowledge in you know the anatomy physiology etc so it's learning about the client and the type of person you've got as well what sort of key steps did you take to get to where you are today so like uni and college what steps did you take to get to where you are so yeah i mean 
I started in physio. So, I mean, if, if I look at my kind of two professions, physio and personal training, um, I think for you guys, like f from a physio perspective, you there's, there's no real uh, entry in other than getting a degree in physio. Uh, you, you need to go to university, you need to get a degree in physio and then start from there. Um, the general progression from there would be to, you don't have to, but would, would be to work for the NHS for a couple of years, which is what I did. Um, even if you're kind of interested in sport or you're interested in kind of muscle conditioning or branching off into those areas, I still think it's valuable to go into the NHS to get, get your broad spectrum of knowledge. Um, you work all sorts of different areas. You work in respiratory and neurological. So that's working with like stroke patients, uh, Parkinson's disease respiratory which you know a lot of the physios right now will be will be in the intensive care wards with um, a lot of the chest patients with with covid right now um it just gives you that extra knowledge to be able to then you know one actually make sure that the niche that you want to go into is that sometimes people then transition into the, one of those injuries because they didn't realize that, that would be what they enjoyed so that's kind of where i went first and then i kind of grew my interest in more of the later stage physio which was more rehab which then kind of turned into and evolved into kind of personal training and kind of more conditioning I enjoyed that part more which is why I started to take more smaller courses in in personal training and, and develop that there um, but if, if you're looking to almost reverse that and go personal training first then you know even though you can do sports science degrees which is great it's great foundation knowledge and then move into personal training courses if there is entry level to just start a personal training course and, and work through lots of different, you know, little niche courses and, and improve your knowledge that way. And there's some, I know some incredible trainers that never went to university, um, that have just kind of started at 16 and, and went through uh, the smaller course route. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong uh, way of doing it. It's just what, what that individual wants and what's best for them really. <clears throat> that yeah that's interesting because uh, like you like you say ben for physiotherapy you've got to be you've got to be stamped you know stamp that's the physiotherapy route for for nutrition it's 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 a little bit like personal training and the strength and conditioning world in that so you can you can become a dietitian which is um is state registered and then you would you, sim similar you'd probably you know you do some time in the hospital and then you could specialize in other things after that you can go um nutritional therapy route and there's various routes uh to qualify as a nutritional therapist you can either you can either do degree route um diploma um masters and and there's modular based uh courses out there which you can then convert into a master's in in these areas and in sports nutrition as well um and you and with personal training that's what i did i did the modular i took two years doing lots of different modules and I, actually that was i found that quite challenging actually almost more challenging my first degree was in uh political philosophy so it wasn't related at all although teaching yourself to think in a critical manner whenever you're approaching any discipline is key because ultimately what you'll end up doing is reviewing a lot of scientific papers to to weed out the stuff that that doesn't work the stuff that might work and the stuff that does work so that that kind of critical thinking is is vital i'd say to finding the things that work for your client because really what you get judged on once you got the, your foot in the door is how how well you make people feel and how much they value your service so as long as you get good at your job you can build you can build a network of clients if you're a personal trainer it you know the same thing if you're a nutritionist and some of them may, may have contacts and that word of mouth thing and then hope you know hopefully that's a route into working in the particular areas that you that you uh, think you want to work in most. This might jump on to a future question, but one thing I would say is a, a key bit of advice is anything you think you want to do 
or any role that you really fancy yourself in is try and find some good people who are doing that role and then go along and either buy them some lunch or spend some time talking to them on the phone or even better still when we're allowed shadow them for a few days and find out actually is that what you really want to do because sometimes it will be often it will be but sometimes it actually won't and then you need to have to rethink and have a little look at your next plan forwards thanks for that um so the next question is would you say experience is just as important as qualifications uh, absolutely i mean both are important obviously like but if you know if i had to choose one or the other you know obviously you need the quali qualifications for the foundation but you can't you can't beat experience um like i remember you know classic so i remember coming out of uh my degree of physio and you know i'm not ashamed to me i had a feeling of not knowing anything <laughs> obviously you know you, you of course know a lot of background information but i uh i went off cut long i went off to africa and did some uh, physio out for a sports team in africa um i was massively out, out of my depth um but the experience that i got you know it was very much learn on the job um the team out there was like the main it would be the equivalent of manchester united in in, in we were in ghana um but they had zero medical team so i was the most qualified person for their whole football team so even though my personal kind of limitation felt that like i was underqualified from their perspective obviously the value i was given them was it was better than nothing um i remember you know ringing colleagues that would finish university you know, well back then it was email we had to go and find internet cafes like five miles down the road and then email uh your, your colleagues and figure out you know this guy's got this pain what do you think um you know it's very much learning on the job and i just think that overall you're constantly learning um you know like the more niche you get and the more kind of expert you get you know matt's a, you know we're very fortunate we've got somebody like matt on not to give him too big an ego, but he's one of the best trainers, nutritionists in the country. You know, and that I always look at like the definition of, of guru and expert. And like an expert is always wanting to like learn new information, always open to understanding what, what he doesn't know and collaborate with other people. And those experiences is, is what you, your profession is around. And that's, you know, you can't like buy experience. Um, you know, the, the guruism is very much like, I want, you know, I, I think I know everything. And that, you know, that kind of attitude is, you know, the worst way to go. You will never become, you know, a good at your profession if that's, if that's the attitude. So the attitude is be the expert, show that your knowledge base is always open to learning. And that can only be done through experience. Mm. It's a, it's a really interesting question. The, I think the one of the critical things is these days it's very difficult to get forward just on experience only because to get your foot in the door there'll kind of be a, a level of ABC that the the auto <coughs> um, the auto checking on the computers will just whiz through all the CVs and if you haven't got ABC you're just not going to get a you know, chance at an interview if you're lucky you might know a few people who can pull a few strings but you have you almost have to tick those education boxes now and then after you've done that then and it is all about experience and like ben said you, experience i think has the edge in in terms of being a good practitioner but you you know in all these areas you have to be um accountable and you have to be insured and and though, though that's just bread and butter and without without a piece of paper you know you can't get the insurance now the other thing that's happening a lot at the moment which wasn't around when me and, me and ben were youngsters is is social media and the internet being you know as prevalent as it is so you've got a million experts on on youtube instagram trying to pick your way through the ones who know what they're talking about and the ones who don't it's quite difficult and particularly in nutrition which is is a real minefield it, 
one reason is that lots of different things work on people for different reasons so and we are highly adaptable uh, species that ties into ben's point about building yourself a team of people that can keep you accountable and that you can keep learning from and keep bouncing ideas off so you don't get too blinkered in your approach i, I think that's that's also really really important as you go forwards how um how closely aligned would you say your two jobs are? Would you ever work together? Yeah, I think there's a massive massive crossover, particularly in uh, particularly in personal training and nutrition, especially. Like, I think they should be in physio and in, in medicine. However, I think there's uh, that needs to be improved. If I'm honest, I think physios, medics, kind of, I think it is getting better, but I don't think they fundamentally. Uh, they understand the fundamentals of nutrition and understand the, the health benefits of how they can use nutrition as part and parcel of their kind of treatment protocols. Um, I think definitely, the, you know, the best, put it this way, the best trainers have a good base of nutritional knowledge. But like Matt saying earlier, like as you kind of go through your profession, you'll start to kind of find your niche and you can't be an expert in everything. You know, I refer a lot of my clients uh, to Matt. Um, so if they need you know, further help with their nutrition and it's outside of my kind of limitation of my own knowledge base, then Matt is the first person that I send them to. Um, and, you know, our professions, we, we cross over quite a bit uh, with, with that. I, I mean, I, I just, I agree with everything uh, Ben just said. I think the phrase to think about is performance team. So if you, if you look at any elite team, there will be physical therapists, physios, doctors, nutritionists, uh, strength and conditioning, as well as the coaches who are specific to the skill set that the team needs. And that's just that's just an integrated, holistic, if you like, approach to performance, which is important. So yeah, plenty of crossover there. What What do you think? Uh... Matt, you probably best answers. Would you say that obviously the sport world is like ahead, obviously, of the, the general kind of, you know, if you look at the kind of NHS public health, as it were, the, the sport world have a better understanding of that integration, into, particularly in, in nutrition? Yeah, I think um, what, you, what you're seeing now is lots of people are trying to apply that same performance team model in the in the real world if you like so you've got sports clinics popping up in and around the place that have all the practitioners all under one roof but also with with these with the corporate wellness programs obviously everyone's really health aware now because if you're if your workforce is healthy well it used to be that they wouldn't take so many days off sick and they probably work a bit harder for you because they felt valued but now it's now it's all about you know viral viral control and healthy people don't get super generally don't get super ill. Um, so so yeah, these the, these programs and integrated um, approaches are much much more uh, in need right now. I think. Um, how important would you say mental well being is alongside physical health and fitness? Is this something that you'd work on with clients too? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, if I just, if I take the, I think it's, it's probably core, the core foundation of, uh, of a lot of our clients. So if, if not everybody, I think there's, I think the first stage is really is awareness. Um, I think we often, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not an ex expert in mental health, but I think as a trainer in particular, we almost act as unofficial counsellors at times with the type of uh, you know, clients, uh, goals, et cetera, that we have. I think one thing that we do is, as a, if I, my personal opinion is that I think we generally label, oh, he's got a mental health issue. Whereas I see it more as a sliding scale. I think everybody can, can have and does have mental health issues. And it's just how we use strategies, coping mechanisms to you know, lower that or in some cases, obviously, the people that str really struggle, you know, have 
you know, maybe not, don't have the same amount of awareness or knowledge to have the right coping strategy. And there's, you know, Matt will explain there's a huge amount of nutrition element to mental health issues as well that, that you can have. But in terms of like clients in particular, if I take a classic example, you know, a, a client might turn up and say, I want, I want to lose X amount of weight. A lot of the reasoning behind that is mental health kind of issues, even if they don't fully understand that themselves at that particular time. A lot of it will revolve around self-esteem, confidence. You know, what they're really asking is how can I, you know, improve that? And when they, you know, drop a couple of dress sizes, it's that kind of self-confidence, self-esteem improvement that's the real win, you know, and that overall mental well-being um, and the improvement that they get in that, you know, is, is the overriding, overriding positive. Yeah, I think... This is a massive area, mental wellness and behavioural wellness. I think that phrase, um, where the mind goes, the body will follow. So if, you, if you're compromised mentally, emotionally, then all the, all the other aspects of your journey forwards are going to be hampered somewhat. Now, I, I think immediately that we didn't mention them in the first round of performance team, but obviously team psychologist, sometimes referred to as mental strength coach, they'd be a vital part of that, that, that team. So you know that when it's, when it's a bit more than a cup of tea and a chat kind of stuff, you've got to refer across. So if there's any clinical signs and symptoms of um, depression, anxiety, even um, lear learning style difficulties. So, ADHD, I, I consult with quite a few clients with ADHD uh, in conjunction with their psychologist. So there's a, there's a massive, massive amount you can do with food because obviously everything you eat affects how your brain can function and express itself. So if you look at behavioral wellness, if the brain's got everything it needs, there's no physical or chemical reason then the, the brain should be depressed because there's lots of things you can eat and drink which make you feel unwell mentally um so once you've fixed up all that if you've got the right mental strengthening coach or psychologist then that's a sort of that's a direct uh example of how nutrition and perform mental performance can integrate really nicely so yeah vital vital and something to keep keep your eye on especially now in lockdown because this isolation is, is really taxing for many many people yeah, I think that's hundred percent correct in terms of what you're saying is finding this. What's the source of you know? It's obviously often quite difficult, but if what's the source of their kind of uh, their problems? And if like like Matt said, if it's out of your scope, then absolutely, you know, refer up to the specialist in that field. Um, if it's not something that's you know the kind of general mood changes that we can all experience, that you know, obviously we everybody. You don't have to be a specialist to be able to help. Um, certain everybody can help with uh, people having problems with that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, I think mental health in sport is sort of looked over. Um, I don't think it's like I don't. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's talked enough in sport. Um, but what would you say are the best and worst parts of your job? Cool. Uh, say well the best off the top of my head I think as an overall I think just when you have a client with a fitness goal whatever that might be um, or you know from physio aspect if they're in pain I think especially when you get somebody who's really motivated and it's really challenging their daily life uh, and you are part of that plan to help them recover and you get to that point of that they've recovered or if it's an, an achievement goal in terms of you know a challenge a running challenge swimming challenge etc you know take those ones that are that kind of long term you know months potentially years and you've got to that kind of end point the, the kind of self-satisfaction of that you know the feeling that you get there's nothing better than that um, in terms of the overall positive of the of the job um worst part uh early starts 
So my, my alarm goes at 5.30 and my first client is usually at seven o'clock in normal times. Um, at the minute, I'm really enjoying my lions during this coronavirus. But, uh, but yeah, but, you know, the positive of that is we, we control, particularly when you run your own business, you control your diary. So I choose to put my clients in at seven and uh, mentally how I get around that is I like the thought of earning money at seven, eight o'clock when people are still sleeping. So that's how I kind of help myself raise out of bed at 5.30 a.m. What about you, Matt? I think um, it's fix, fixing problems. So, you know, you know, making people feel better, seeing, seeing their seeing things that can be really out of balance come back into balance, be it deficiencies or uh, dysregulated blood sugar and all the things that can go wrong with wrong with humans, just making them a bit better. Combine, you know, combine with any associated success. Although the funny thing is about success is you can be doing the, you can be doing the best work of your life. And if, if all aspects of that team environment aren't conducive to winning, then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much how good your nutritional protocols are. So you always have to take success with a little bit of a pinch of salt in, in terms of winning and losing medals and so on. And running your own business, I think the worst bits about running your own business are having to do all the admin. So, you know, whilst it's good, you can always employ people to help you a bit, but obviously everyone you, everyone you employ is going to cost a bit more money. Um, so working through spreadsheets, accounting, things that you may not naturally be good at, but you just got to do them. So yeah, that's, but every job has those, has those boring aspects. So that's where you just um, have a cup of tea, prioritize the stuff you don't want to do most first and then get that out of the way so you can focus on some some of the fun stuff later on in your day you both mentioned your business there um what advice would you have for young people looking to start their own businesses in sport uh, many <laughs> yeah. um it's hard to pin it down to just a couple but i mean fundamentally i'd say and this this isn't i wouldn't say specific to sport as such but make sure it's your passion make sure that you actually love it um as matt touched on there are there's some you know administration tasks that are not so fun and a lot of things that aren't so fun so and i think the biggest thing that i've found personally is you know I've, I've, before setting up my own business i worked for other organizations essentially i had a boss and if i don't turn up to work essentially I get fired. So I'm accountable to that boss. But when you work for yourself, um, you're only accountable to yourself from that aspect. So you need to love it because you need to be self-motivated. No one's telling you to wake up and get out of bed and turn up to work apart from yourself. Um, so that The kind of mindset of around self-motivation um, is huge. You know, I'm sure Matt's got loads of stuff. Part of that, Self-motivation is uh, mentorship. Matt talked about it earlier about finding finding people that are doing what you want to do or achieving you know, your, your overall goal and vision and following the best practices of what they're doing. Um, but yeah, Matt, what else have you got? I mean, there's many more. Yeah, I think that, that those are really valid points. I think you've hit on that self-motivation thing. I think that's one of the key things. So. I, I, I think at any age and probably as early as you can, if you can get, get your head stuck into some good um, behavior change, goal settings type text, there's two I can think of which are particularly good. One's called tiny habits and one's called atomic habits. Because ultimately when you're regulating your, when you're your own boss, you've got to be, the best at managing your own behavior as possible. Because if you can't manage your own behavior, then you've got no chance of managing anyone that comes and works for you. Um, in terms of starting your own business, I think it's it's quite easy to set up as a, a sole trader. So that would be a good place to start. 
And if, if you can make a success of that, then you can think about starting a limited company or something else, unless there's some specific tax reason that you want to start a limited company from the, from the word dot. But yeah, follow your dreams. And ultimately, it's, it's that passion and drive which will be the success or the failure. I think if I was going to add to that, I think, Matt, you touched, obviously, you touched on uh, a couple of books and the general principles of, like, uh, I remember well, personal development. Uh, being a northerner, I remember uh, a, business, a business mentor of mine talking about personal development. I was quite, I was probably quite well, old in comparison to what I, well, I would have hoped to have been, uh, enjoyed this kind of stuff, but I would probably be, like, late 20s. To me, that kind of buzz personal development world was all a bit airy fairy. I'll be honest, I didn't think I kind of needed it, but I would say it's the number one thing that I, I look to kind of learn and develop now. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you know it, for, for me, personal development is just any kind of material that helps set your mindset, helps you get better and make it work for you. Um, so, you know, in this world, like today, we've got, you know, YouTube, podcasts, find people that you can relate to and, you know, listen to those those guys. It does, what works for me might not work for you um, and find something that, you know, really triggers your inspiration. Um, and that's, you know, that really sets, like, your attitude. If, if you're going to be successful running your own business, your attitude is, is paramount. It has to be positive. It has to be open-minded. And like, I think one of the biggest things that people will, you know, fear is is messing up, making mistakes, failing. And it's, it's almost like twist that mindset to, to think of the opposite. Like failing, making mistakes is actually part of being successful. And I always like to think of it, I don't know where I heard this from, but it would have been from a book or a podcast or something. Uh, think of it like a pendulum. So when you fail, it's, it's essentially you're moving outside of your comfort zone. Think about when you have felt nervous about something, that's essentially moving outside of your comfort zone. So if you only move a small amount, you're only going to get small success. Because when you move out of your comfort zone in a big way, and if you fail multiple, multiple times, what you should be doing is learning from those mistakes. How can I get better at those, at those kind of failures and mistakes? So they shouldn't be seen as a negative thing. They should be seen as a positive thing. So the, the more you fail and the quicker you fail and the bigger you fail, Will return in bigger success so if you can get your mindset to think like that then you'll become less fearful about jumping into uh situations that you know are nervous you're afraid of that feel like out of your comfort zone and, and that's how you progress your business going forward and particularly in business because like matt said before you're you not only have to be good at your kind of chosen profession in this case nutrition training uh physio etc you need lots of skills, skills in networking. Um, me and Matt met actually, I can't remember exactly, it was like a random network event. We, we were looking at scanning technology and I was showing him the scanning technology. You know, it wasn't in the clinic setting, me doing my physio work. It was going outside of our boundaries and looking at different aspects, um, going to different events, learning new skills, learning things outside of the, of the health fitness world. So you can bring in those skills and make your business better. So I think as an overall, it's that kind of development attitude that you get through materials will set yourself in a position to kind of move your business forward. Uh, great advice. Um, so what do you think about like setting goals? Like how important do you think it is to set goals in like your sport or what you want to do in life? You go for that, Matt. Uh, well, that, I mean, that's, that's pretty much along the lines of that self-development route because that essentially is all about goal setting. So it, it's vital. Yeah, you can't, you can't succeed without some form of uh, planning, goal setting, pro, you know, progressions, forecasting, looking at different scenarios, around different ways forwards um and and those two texts i mentioned are basically goal setting um goal setting texts because the reason they're called behavior change texts is because 
if you can't change your behaviour, then you won't be able to achieve your goals in some, in some aspects. So yeah, at, I mean, the phrase I sometimes use is, if you if you're goalless, you're a bit like a ship at sea without any sails. So you know where you end up is going to be random according to the the available wind and the currents, and that's about it. You can't decide where you're going to go. So yeah, set those set those goals and keep setting them. Write those lists and keep writing them. Well, I think we are almost at the end now. So we've got some quick fire questions. Um, what is your favorite sport to watch? Ooh. I mean, if you'd have asked me this a few years ago, I, I would have always said football, but uh, I love, I'm loving the, uh, the IPL or the Big Bash in the, uh, the Australia. So that'd be right up there right now. Yeah, my, I think mine's any any fighting sport, so boxing, Thai boxing, MMA. Um, is there anyone within the industry that inspires you or influences your work? Ooh. I mean, in physio training, I mean, there's lots of. I say, I wouldn't say our profession isn't renowned for producing like celebrities or famous people. There are a few. Um, top of my head, I can think of like Gary Lewin, who was, a, who was an England physio. But for me, it's, it, they're, like, they're obviously great at their profession. And we, you know, you hear lots of names and books and things like that of, of research. I think for me, and the best inspiration I get from is people I can relate to. Um, so actually some of my, my friends uh, who I went to university with, they're doing great things, um, you know, one physio teaches all around the world so for me it's, it's about finding people that have had similar backgrounds and they're doing incredible things knowing that you know it's more of a mindset thing that that only stops your kind of limitations um yeah that's a good question i mean if you said uh said to me greatest influences well that when i was a kid it was arnold schwarzenegger and bruce lee <laughs> Every one of those texts, I suppose, would be a little bit like someone that influences you a little bit. And there's another room downstairs, which is just the same. So I think you just have to draw on as many different positive sources of influence as you possibly can, both from books and um, people that you might know. As a kid, if I was going to say it'd be Ian Wright, though, he was my favourite player. <laughs> I loved his enthusiasm and actually if you if you read his story and there's quite a few YouTube videos and various things about him it's pretty awesome okay and I think that brings us to the end so thank you Ben and Matt for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us but yeah that's it thanks, thanks ben. Ben. Uh, thank you you're very welcome cheers for sharing that with us no worries. Nice one. Nice to meet you guys.